Uh, PCL3, holy crap, I don't even know what that's called. Uh, can anybody tell me what PCL3 is? Oh, I'm sorry, you guys already know that. Phosphorus trichloride, uh-huh, all right. Hey, let me ask you a quick question. Could that violate the octet rule? Could phosphorus trichloride violate the octet rule? I actually gave you a brand new one again last class, so hopefully you didn't lose that one. I gave you a brand new one again last class, all right, during the lab. So uh, could that violate the octet rule? Could phosphorus violate the octet rule? Could it? Could phosphorus? No. Phosphorus could. Yes, phosphorus could. Why could phosphorus violate the octet? Could it? All right. I think I went over this again last class. Could it violate phosphorus? P. Yes or no? no. Yes. Why? All right. It's in period three. All right. It has a, a, a quantum number of three. All right, quantum number three. So it can expand to the 3D and use that orbital, all right, my 3D. So if it's a third period, it can expand. So uh, some of those questions, those, those expand octet questions, those things are very common. If it's not in the third period, it, it could violate it, but it's really a lot less likely to do it, all right? So uh, I think there was one maybe that I asked if it violates the octet rule um, on that. But it, yeah, it had to be one in period three or more. All right, so let's just quickly draw this. All right, uh, who wants to help me out on this? Thank you, Allie. Uh, what do you got? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. There's two more on phosphorus. All right, perfect. All right, two more on phosphorus. Ah, uh, what is that shape? We got to be able to do this right off the top of our head. So if you need to study that, the time. All right, uh, AX3E, uh, trigonal pyramidal. All right, so that's good. All right, pyramid. All right, I'm just going to say that. Uh, what is the electron domain geometry? Act electron domain is tetrahedral. Why? Yeah, there's four things here. Four things. That means four points. That's what that means, four points. All right, uh, real quick, uh, angle just because we're kind of creepy. What would it be? All right, 109.5, but minus 2.5, 107. Now, there's a good thing that I always like to tell people. Only do that for the tetrahedral electron domain geometries. Don't do it for any others. So if you see a lone pair on anything outside the electron domain geometry of tetrahedral, don't subtract the 2.5. It's not expected that you do that. But for these, it is, yes. So, but it's still true for every It is true, but uh, when I went back and so I checked, I said, so I checked all the AP exams. So, like, if you have something that's uh, like square planar, what are the angles on that? 90. What about uh, trigonal bipyramidal? 90 and 120. But if you have a lone pair, it's not expecting you to do 87.5 and 117.5, uh, it's, it's asking you to say 90 and 120. All right? And they will provide a range, but the only time they want you to apply it is for tetrahedrals. All right? So after that, that should be easy. So it's really only going to have to go down to 104.5, and then the rest, just whatever you saw, it is. Okay, so, all right, so we have this. Now let's figure out if this is polar or nonpolar. Uh, okay, which way are my arrows going to go on this for my dipoles? Which way are my arrows going to go? Towards chlorine or towards phosphorus? Towards phosphorus. Towards chlorine, right? Chlorine's more electronegative. Yeah, it's closer to fluorine. Than All right, so they're going to go this way. All right, so they're going to go out here. All right, so we have some dipole moments. 
But wait a minute. We also have this big bad uh, electron pair, which trumps basically everything. Look at my huge dipole going that way. All right. Who's going to win in that tug of war? Is there, is there going to be a winner? Oh, yeah. Lone pair is the strongest. All right. So this is the strongest. All right. You may have three of them pulling down and away, which would have a dipole going that way or up. The question is, does the molecule have, is it pulled in equal and opposite directions exactly the same? No. no. All right. So this molecule is polar. Molecules polar. All right. The bonds are also polar. And did I tell you my little secret that I learned in AP chemistry in high school? Did I tell you my little secret? If it has a lone pair, it's lone pair equals polar. All right. That's the easiest thing to do it. That doesn't mean if it has two lone pairs, it's polar because the two lone pairs could be on opposite sides. All right. It just depends on what shape it is. Obviously, water is polar. It has two lone pairs because they're on the top. But if I had one on the top, one on the bottom, and then like four Fs coming off it, it could be nonpolar. All right, so let's take a look at this one. BCL3. All right, uh, I got five. I got again, I got uh, or three. Uh, three plus, okay, um, 21 is 24. All right, so we got this, we got this, we got this. CL, CL, CL. Oh, this is nice. All right. I, I actually drew it wrong. Why did I draw it wrong? Why did I draw it wrong? Because there's no what? There's no lone pair. So I don't need to draw it. I'm going to draw it exactly like this. And I do that every time. So you see, OK, there's no lone pairs. If there's no lone pairs, what happens is they're going to pull in equal and opposite directions. OK, so the question is, is the bond polar or nonpolar? The bond. Are we going to have a dipole in these bonds? What do you think the electronegativity difference between boron and chlorine is? Are there? Is there? Boron and chlorine. Yes, there is. So the bond is polar. The bond is polar. The molecule is, what do you think? Nonpolar, because they're all pulling in equal and opposite directions. All right, so there's a difference. Make sure you know the bond versus molecule. Yes. Um, so would you say that there's like dipoles because there was one of the homework where like they had the little videos and they were like showing like the dioxide versus tetrahedral and like the bonds were polar, but then it said there was. The bonds were polar, but there were no dipoles. Yeah. I'm not. These dipoles all cancel. Oh. All right, so these dipoles cancel. I think that's what you're asking me. Dipoles cancel. No one's going to win. The actual individual bond is polar. All right, the individual bond is polar. There are no dipole moments in this because they're going to cancel. I think that's what you're asking me, right? Okay, yes. Yeah, it's very simple. You have to take some time to go over your electronegativity values. Um, if I see a big gap in between on the periodic table, like boron is in column three, chloride is in column seven. We know column seven holds fluorine, the most electronegative one. So if it's closer to that, you're going to send an arrow towards that. Um, that's the easiest way to do it. Also, knowing fluorine's 4.0, oxygen 3.5, nitrogen's three, carbon's 2.5. Hydrogen's a 2.1, chlorine is a 3.0, sulfur's, uh, I'm not really sure, something like that. But if you take some time just to get a couple of those other ones outside of the fluorine, then you'll know. All right? I think so, right around 3.0. All right? All right. Um, so those are the ways that I would do that, okay? Um, that is the way. But if I'm just looking at it and I say, okay, I have boron and chlorine or I have phosphorus and chloride, yes. Chlorine is more electronegative than phosphorus because it's more to the right. All right, remember, noble gases have how much electronegativity? None. Yeah, noble gases have zero electronegativity. 
Fluorine has the most. They have none. They don't want to attract electrons. They're already top of the food chain. All right, moving on. All right, let's see. All right, there we go. Okay. What's that? Of course, yeah, then they're going to be nonpolar, yeah, 100%. Yeah, and they're going to have dispersion forces in them. Yeah, okay. Now, there's another little side note that somebody was asking me. I don't know um, per se if we actually talked about it, but if you have hydrogen bonding, you have every force below it as well. So if it's hydrogen bonding, that means you have hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole, and dispersion. If you have dipole, dipole, you have dipole, dipole, and dispersion. If you have dispersion, you only have dispersion. Yes? But is student hydrogen bond just like a form of dipole-dipole? It is a form of a stronger form of dipole-dipole. But you, you have to list all three. If you have hydrogen bonding, you have the other two. If you have dipole-dipole, you have dispersion. If you have dispersion, you only have dispersion. This is something to know. So somebody could ask you, be like, oh, water has, you know, what intermolecular forces? You list all three, full credit. You list just hydrogen bonding, you do not get full credit. So just a, a, a little side note on that. Uh, valence bond theory. Uh, so merges Lewis structures with the idea of atomic orbitals, 2s, 3p. Lewis theory, sa uh, Lewis theory says covalent occurs when atoms share electrons. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, covalent bonding occurs when valence orbitals of adjacent atoms overlap. Then two electrons of opposite spin one from each atom combined to form a bond. If there's no overlap, there's no bond. It's just like Velcro on your shoe. If you don't attach it, it's not tied. It's not done. Okay, so the valence bond theory. So in this part, we're getting into how covalent bonds form and hybridization. Okay, and then boom, we'll have just enough time to finish up sigma and pi bonds, and that is perfect. All right, so let's take a look at H2. So we have one H, all right, and we have an unpaired electron in the one S orbital, all right. So if I'm going to pair up a, an H, I'm going to need another hydrogen with a negative one half. This is a positive one half, clockwise spinning, all right. This is a, all right, and then we're going to need, okay, so now we have an unpaired electron in the 3P. So we're going to find a, a chlorine with a, a down spinning one in the 3P. So if I look at H2, very simple. I will have my two, I have my overlap, and right there I'm forming my covalent bond. All right, so, all right, that's fine. Let's take a look. All right, so obviously this is not H2, so what we would have is, let's just pretend that this is an up arrow and one down arrow in there, which is, you know, electron of opposite spins. All right, electrons of opposite spins. All right. So we found another hydrogen in the atmosphere in the universe somewhere, and it happened to have a, a, a counterclockwise spin. Upwards is clockwise, down. So, so we paired them up, and at that point, we have two electrons being shared. Two electrons shared. All right, and guess what? What type of forces does this have? Dispersion only. All right, dispersion only. If they are nonpolar, they're going to have basically dispersion only. Mm, I'm going to say not nah, uh, dispersion. All right, so dispersion. Okay, now we have a bigger atom coming along, a chlorine. All right, so again, when I'm when I'm reviewing uh, for this. Uh, I say the study guide is due, but again, we want to have our, our lab. You want to really review your lab on that because that's where we really talked about, you know, IMFs more than in the notes. All right. Okay. Uh, so I have CL2. Now at this point, uh, I have, uh, oh, what type of orbital is this? This is a P orbital. How do you know? It's shaped like a P. Remember the dumbbell shape? Dumbbell shape. So when we overlap them, we got to bring in another dumbbell, and we're going to have a 
in this, we're going to have, you know, one of our P, right? So this is a P electron up and a P electron down. Two P electrons. To P or not to P, that's the question before community. Aha. Uh -huh. I don't understand why all my kids always walk in third period um, after community and we have 25 minutes and they're like, oh, can I go to the bathroom? I was like, you just had 25 minutes. Why, why couldn't you go to the bathroom in 25 minutes? All right, so those are two P electrons, one up, one down. And let's take a look at one last one, uh, HCl. Now, what would happen in an HCl? What would happen? In an HCl, what would happen? What orbitals are they going to come from? What orbitals are they going to come from? An H and a CL. A P and an S. Oh, wait a minute. So one from the S and one from the P. All right. So now I have a little bit of hybridization going on here. I have an SP. Oh, that's what that is. That's what that is. Oh, okay. All right. So I got a little SP going on here. I got one S and I got uh, one P in there. Orbital is the overlap region responsible for the bond. All right, so now we need to talk a little bit more about uh, the wonderful ways that this happens. And I actually have my little cheat sheet of notes here. All right, so, so we have this H2 molecule. All right, uh, so. I wanted to make sure that I had a better explanation than I did uh, yesterday. I thought it was good, but I didn't think it was good enough. All right, so we have this lovely line. All right, and this line travels the opposite way. All right, it travels the opposite way. It's not really going this way, it's kind of going this way. All right, and at this point right here, and I forgot, see that's the problem, I forgot the actual distance. I'm such a slacker. This distance right here, we're measuring this in angstroms. All right, what's an angstrom? 10 to the negative 10th. All right, this is 0 0.74 angstroms. Oops, that's terrible. Just totally missed that. All right, 7.4 angstroms. All right, so what we have on this point is we're going to have our two hydrogen molecules right here. Here they are. All right, and at this point, they're kind of getting attracted to each other. All right, they're kind of getting attracted to each other at this point. We have weak attractive forces. Mm -hmm. Weak attractive forces. Uh, what are those called? Yeah, dispersion. All right, so they're weakly attracted to each other depending on where the electron is located on the nucleus. All right, and what happens is as they move closer to one another, we find an optimal distance right here. All right, an optimal distance. All right, and that optimal distance is 0 0.74 angstroms. This right here. So where it's bonded exactly. All right, and now what happens is they will keep moving closer together as we go this way. Uh, they will keep moving closer together. All right, and what's happening to the line? All right, what's happening? Okay, this value here as well, let me give you this value, is negative 400. This is energy in kilojoules per mole. All right, this is negative 400. 36, all right, negative 436 right here, all right, mm, okay, so negative 436 kilojoules per mole, all right, so as we move up this line and we're going this way, they're key, they, they are still attracting to each other more, all right, they haven't found a nice little niche, all right, the electron pair all right, doesn't screen the nucleus. Doesn't screen the nuclear, uh, nuclear repulsion as much anymore. All right, so the proton-proton repulsion. All right, it's not screening that as much anymore. All right, so what's happening to the energy then? 
All right, we're getting into a positive range. All right, a positive range. So what does that mean? Does the molecule want to stay together at that point? Probably not. All right, so they're going to start repelling until they get back to their optimal distance. So this is kind of like a yo-yo. It's going to go one way and back the other way. All right, once you form this bond, it's going to kind of yo-yo like this. All right, unless it's going to separate out again. It's going to kind of yo-yo, depending on where the location of the electron is. All right, so uh, let me think. So we have two things here. All right, we can do this. All right, we can go up from here or we can go down from here. All right, so if we go down, uh, this energy, this is the bond energy. All right, bond energy uh, when bonds form, when the bond forms. Is energy given off or taken in when the bond forms? Based on that graph, the down arrow. All right, it's given off. All right, energy given off. Again, hence the uh, Flannery hate hate debate. Energy is given off when the bond forms. And I think I went over this about Mr. Pasta dinner. All right, you get the energy when the bond forms into something usable. So the other arrow indicates, all right, energy is released. All right. Uh, energy is, all right, bond energy is absorbed, sorry, energy is absorbed, this other one's released. Uh, bond energy absorbed, all right, when bond broken, all right, so if I get, continue on the other way, all right, it's going to be absorbed when the bond is broken, all right. Let's see, what else do I have here? All right, so at this point, this is called the optimal point. Uh, that is the uh, best to reduce, best to reduce uh, nuclear, nuclear repulsions. I guess that's what I would say. Or proton, proton, nuclear, nuclear repulsions. I had a lot of stuff on this. Uh, all right, uh, bond length versus bond energy. Uh, okay, uh, we have the bond energy on the left side uh, to break bonds, uh, making bonds. Let's see, let's see, what else do I have? Shorter, double, triple. Let's see, move closer together. I guess that's what I have on that. All right, let's just expand on that just a little bit uh, for multiple choice type purposes. All right, let's just say this doesn't apply. This applies to boron. All right, I have boron here. So if I had boron uh, and I have this boron at an 83.0, uh, let's say, picometers. All right, so that distance from the nucleus to the outermost electron is boron, is 83.0. All right, so we have this, all right. Uh, if I had the radius of a boron boron, what would be the radius of that? What is it? One, I heard it, 166 picometers. Now, if we're given a chart on this stuff and we find out the actual Meters. What do you think that means? Like say if I had like uh, B2Cl2, all right, let's just say I had this molecule and we found out that the actual bond length was 175. What would it tell you about the bond? Strong or weak? It would definitely be what? Weaker, all right, so just to, to Harp on that a little bit. Let's just say I had rhenium. Uh, oops, yeah, rhenium. And let's try it one more time. So I had 137.5. My rhenium rhenium bond would be what? What? Nah. 275. 
All right, and then I find out in my little chart that AP gives me, I have 224 picometers. All right, for let's say RE2CL8, I had 224. What does it tell you about the bond of that? Sharp. Okay, so you see what I'm trying to show you? And that directly applies to this chart. All right, it would be the same type of thing. All right, same type of thing. Yes? I understand that, like, how that, like, translates, but I'm so confused as to what that means on the graph. To what that means on the graph? Yeah, so, like, how does, I, I, yeah, I'm so confused as how that correlates to the... Okay, so, uh, all right, so this, so what we're trying to say is that if we were to put this into a molecule, all right, all right, and all of a sudden that decreased, what would happen to this area right here? This length. It's gotten stronger. So this hill would kind of fade off like this. All right? If not, if it gets weaker, this hill is going to go up more. All right. All right, very good. All right, I guess I went off on a long tangent on that guy. All right, optimum distance. All right, so let's talk about hybridized, uh, hybridized orbitals. All right, uh, valence bond can explain some observations without molecular compounds. So we got to kind of roll through this. Uh, so not all the times are we going to have easily just uh, very simple P's are combining with P's and, and S's are combining with S's. Oh, isn't that sad? All right, so if I just take a look at this, and you know what? I'm not even going to spend time on this. What's the hybridization of this? Don't count the, uh, don't count the A. All right, so here you go. So again, you would know that if I looked at this, this would be SP. You might have to draw it. You may have to draw it. That's fine. So what do I have here? I have AX2. Right? So sometimes you might have to draw them if you can't see it. This one right here, I have AX what? This one. Let's just do it our way. Let's just do it our way. What am I going to have? AX3. What is it going to be? What's the hybridization? SP2. What's my hybridization here? A X4. So I have SP3. All right. This one, I have this. All right. I remember this is what the shape is. I have AX2E2 hybridization. SP3. All right. PF5. All right. So what do I got? It's 35 and 5 is 40. All right, so if I did this real quick, see, this is how you do it. This is the fastest way to get to all the answers. F, 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 F. All right, so I have 40 minus 10. I got 30 left over. That means I'm going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 times 6 is 30. I'm exactly right, right? So I'm going to have AX, AX5, and I would have SP. All right, so that's why I'm not spending a lot of time on that. You got it? Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. All right, that's pretty easy. Uh, you, if you draw, you can do this, right? So this whole explanation is kind of not even needed for your comprehension because you already know how to do that. All right, let's get rid of that. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's just showing you how they're... All right, uh, okay, so we're good on that. SP hybridization, it just kind of shows uh, the big bonds here, kind of how they're hybridized. Uh, they look kind of like a, a, a combining between the S and the P. I don't know if I missed anything on that. Uh, don't worry about that. Let's get into our multiple bonds. You don't have to worry about it. You already know it. All right, 
So sigma bonds and pi bonds, the last part of bonding. So happy we're going to finish it before January. That's perfect timing. Uh, sigma bonds are bonds in which the electron density is along the inter Oh my gosh. All right. So what does that mean? <laughs> These are single bonds. All right. We have considered up to this point, single bonds. So you count how many single bonds you have. That's how many sigma bonds you have. So if I had, let's see, let's just see. Oh, this is tough. Ready? All right, ready, ready. Let's see if you can do this. All right, how many sigma bonds do I have? Four. All right, sigma equals single. All right. Sigma equals single. Whoa. All right. All right, the SSP or PP overlap. Also have a PS. Sigma bonds equals single. This is the easiest points on the test. All right, that's why I not spend a lot of time on it. The bonds in ammonia are sigma bonds. All right, multiple bonds result in the overlap of two p orbitals, uh, one from each atom. These are orient orientated perpendicular to the internuclear axis. Uh, okay, all right, these are pi bonds. All right, pi bonds are multiple. So we got to talk about double and triple and what the difference is. All right, unhybridized. All right, pi, look at multi, pi, p, multiple, at single, sigma. All right, here we go. Uh, unhybridized. Okay. All right, pi bonds generally have the weaker sigma bonds because pi bonds have less overlap. So if we did this, we wanted to count how many pi and sigma bonds we have. Hmm. All right. For each carbon atom, there are three sp2 hybridized orbitals. These form sigma bonds, all right, for, with the CRH. And so we have that. So how many sigma bonds do we have? All right, so now we have this. So let's talk about this. What does it mean? All right, so if I have a double bond, all right. Oh, single bonds are single. Let me just, let me, I know I'm running out of time. Am I running out of time? No. All right. Here's how easy this is. Are you ready? It's how easy it is. Sigma are single. Double bonds consist of one sigma, one pi. Triple bonds, one sigma, two pi. Triple, one sigma, two pi. Double, one, sing, one sigma, one pi. Single are single bonds are sigma. So if you have a triple bond, you have two pi and one sigma. So a triple bond, you got to have three things. Two pi, one sigma. A double bond, you got to have two things. One pi, one sigma. Single bonds are all sigma. Yes? So pi never exists just on its own. It has to have like You have to have a double bond. Okay? That's easy. It's all it is is counting. All right? So uh, let me ask you this. What does this guy have right here? C2H2. So I have C2H2. Here it goes. What, how many sigma, how many pi? Let's do it. Ready? One, two, three sigma, two pi. Right? One, two, three sigma, two pi. This guy right here, what am I going to have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, sigma. Seven sigma. Uh, what if I had C2H4? So I had this. I need a double bond. All right, real quick. One, two, three, four, five, sigma, one pi. That easy? This, uh, remember, a triple bond is one sigma, two pi. And then I have a sigma, sigma, one sigma, two pi. Easy? Easy. All right.